to talk about a little experience I've come across and some that I've developed myself in collaboration with Chris Costello and other researchers on cooperatives um, in the U.S. and elsewhere, uh, but mainly in the U.S., and see if there are some lessons that might be useful for guiding or informing this process of reform. And to tell you what the, the bottom lines are, what I'm going to have to say, and I'll come back to those at the very end. First of all, uh, I believe that there are potential gains, su substantial gains, from coordinating efforts. And this is important, I think, from an academic point of view, because a lot of the policies that economists recommend don't really take that into account. They don't, in the models we have and the empirical work we generate, it doesn't really have a role for this kind of coordination and the gains from coordination. So that's something I think is important, something I'd like to push, and I'll try and explain that in, in more detail in a few minutes. The second part of it is that, the second message is that uh, when you're, you're formulating these uh, management plans and trying to uh, engender this kind of cooperation in the structure you're setting up, pay careful attention to who's going to lose in this process. There may be aggregate gains, but if the people are going to lose, are going to lose enough, and if they're well enough organized, they may well be able to get together and block what you're trying to do. And so um, there were questions about where are the failures in these co-ops, and I'll explain what one of them was and, uh, and describe it as, the, as my very favorite one. Uh, a little context for what I'm going to have to say has to do with just fishery reform in general. For the most part, fishery reform has, has been widespread since uh, the early to mid-1980s, and it's been focused on ending the race to fish. Uh, the race to fish is uh, something that results from having an overall limit on a fishery-wide catch, but not really assigning that to individuals. And each individual would then be able to profit uh, by going in and fishing more rapidly or at a, at a faster rate than, uh, than the other people who are licensed in the industry. And the consequence of that is that fishing intensity is extremely high, in, in order to maintain the allowed catch or the, not to exceed the allowed catch, the regulator is forced to shorten the season. Uh, this emphasis on, on fishing as rapidly as possible dr attracts a lot of excess effort or capacity into the industry. You get crowded conditions, uh, congestion, all the product gets harvested in a very short period of time and its quality is very low then if it has to be stored throughout the year. There are a, a abun an abundant number of problems that arise from this. and. Uh, there are examples, I'll actually show this in a moment, but we have actually, uh, regulators, uh, academic scientists have come up with a scheme, the catch share scheme, which I'll describe in a minute, that has actually gotten rid of a lot of those problems. I just have a couple slides here to illustrate some of this stuff. This is uh, examples from the Alaskan halibut and, and salmon gillnet fisheries, just to show you what this looks like. These are gillnetters competing for uh, sockeye salmon in Bristol Bay. And some of that congestion is due to the fact that the fish tend to arrive over a fairly short period of time. But despite that, a lot of this, uh, a lot of this congestion is due to the fact that there are far too many boats chasing uh, a fixed number of fish. Here's another illustration of the same kind of congestion. You need a, a traffic cop out there to keep people from running into each other. Uh, to show you some actual data, this is on the Alaska halibut fishery, which uh, operated with this allowed catch in a season closure for a long period of time. Ended in ending in 1994, and you see that uh, the solid line indicates the number of days the season was open. Starting in about 1970, it was open almost half the year. This is the, the season length in days on the right hand, right hand side. By the end of this period, it was open for only uh, three 24-hour periods. So all the halibut that were caught in that fishery were concentrated into that tiny number of days right down there. Since then, this fishery has been rationalized. Uh, catch shares with individual quotas were instituted in 1994, and the season has expanded back to about six months again. So now you can get fresh halibut all year long. Uh, boats aren't forced to go out on the three days the fishery is, was open, even if a perfect storm happened to brew on those days, uh, which of course is, uh, can be very costly. And a lot of other good things have come from that. So this uh, catch share approach, kind of going away from having this common industry-wide quota, which people then compete to get until the fishery gets closed, has been replaced by uh, this, these this system of individual catch shares. And I would agree that to a, large, uh, to a large measure, these catch shares have solved these problems. Uh, the way the catch share system works, it divides the industry-wide quota into a bunch of individual quotas or individual catch limits. Then each harvester can decide when and where to exercise uh, his or her quota, 
and they're not forced into uh, the catching the entire catch in a, in a three-day period. In cases where these uh, catch shares are transferable, it oftentimes leads to consolidation to a decrease in the number of harvesters. Uh, and uh, I, I would say that it's, it's fair to say now that catch shares are the regulatory gold standard as far as, as far as managing fisheries, and they've spread fairly widely around the world. Yet, I don't think that they achieve all the gains or all the man they don't accomplish all the management tasks that one would like to accomplish. So what I'm going to do is talk about things that catch shares can't accomplish, or at least uh, have not accomplished to this point, and how you might be able to achieve those, uh, those gains and, and uh, accomplish those tasks with a something more like a cooperative. So what catch share systems do not accomplish? Uh, I'm going to have two parts here. And really preface this with the idea that I think catch shares are the best things that have happened to fishery regulation, at least as I've, I've observed it uh, since I've been studying this. Uh, I'm just saying that they don't go quite as far as we could go and, uh, and that we can uh, impose something uh, along with those that would uh, make us even better off. First of all, they don't manage a heterogeneous stock efficiently. If you have a single quota and a stock is biologically diverse, so maybe in some areas uh, on some patches, uh, say abalone, for example, are growing more rapidly or experiencing lower mortality, then it's quite possible th that it would be ideal to harvest those abalone on that particular patch, either at a younger or older age than abalone on a different patch. And a simple catch share, share system, uh, even if it has uh, uh, size limits and so forth, is not going to achieve that. So ideally, we would, would like to be able to, uh, to adopt a management scheme that, uh, that is a little more nuanced. This, uh, this view of this biological heterogeneity has been emphasis emphasized by Jeremy Prince, who describes fisheries as kind of heterogeneous carpets. So an ideal, ideal management plan would adapt harvests to local biological conditions. Uh, it might also adapt harvests to seasonal factors. Uh, you might like to, to harvest at particular times during the year because prices are high or weather conditions are good. To some extent, this will result from individual harvesters just acting on their own, but not everything gets captured in that fashion. There may be gains from the whole group deciding when it's going to harvest and, uh, and trying to coordinate that action. The other aspect of this that sort of the other gain or management task that, uh, that catch shares do not accomplish has to do with uh, sharing information, and I'll, as I'll point out in a moment, just sharing input. So the kinds of information that people might gain collectively from sharing are information on stock density and the condition of stocks, uh, information on monitoring and enforcement, the kind of on the water information that people were just talking about for, uh, for the purpose of uh, enforcing uh, laws against poaching. Also, information on stock conditions, kind of s gathering scientific information for use in the management process uh, to help the scientists and the managers uh, understand it better. Individuals, even if they have catch, if they're operating with catch shares, don't have incentives to share this kind of information with each other or to gather it and disseminate it collectively. Uh, second, it's possible for an entire fishery to benefit if individuals coordinate in other ways. One way to be would be to coordinate to assure that product quality is high and to therefore achieve a reputation that this fishery delivers product of a certain quality. That could then broaden your market, allow you to, to perhaps uh, get a higher price for the catch. Again, while individuals uh, might have an incentive to harvest their, their, uh, their abalone or other, other species in a way that, uh, that enhances its quality, if that catch gets mixed with other, other catches from this fishery that are of a lower quality, then uh, it's, it's not possible for the individual to gain the, uh, the payoff from, from that kind of share. Other uh, kinds of collective actions or coordinated actions across individuals uh, would be to reseed depleted stocks, to rebuild them. There's evidence that cooperatives do this elsewhere uh, around the world. And also uh, practices that just minimize incidental mortality. So catch shares do a lot of good things. They can lengthen seasons. They can uh, prevent this kind of uh, extreme pulse fishing, the concentrating the catch in, in small periods of time. Uh, but they don't solve a lot of these other problems. So the experience I want to relate to you 
comes from uh, mainly from this one salmon cooperative that operated in Alaska during 2002 to 2005. And I'll talk about a little a little bit about what they did that, that I found uh, intriguing, and also comment a little bit on the fact that it was shut down in 2005 by a group of uh, individuals who chose not to join the co-op. So here's a map about shows you where Chignik is located. It's this uh, this is the Chignik management area, and the fish migrate up toward Chignik Lake up there through Chignik Lagoon. The structure of the co-op, I think, is of some interest here because you're just thinking about forming a co-op. This was voluntarily formed. Uh, permit holders who held uh, first standing permits in this fishery were allowed to join if they wished. They had to join by a certain date in order to participate in the co-op during the coming year. Uh, the co-op itself then received an, its share of the overall catch quota or allowed catch for the fishery based on the number of people that joined. So first approximation, if half the permit holders join, then half of the allowed catch would be given to the co-op to allocate collectively among its members. The co-op members shared profits equally, and uh, the co-op decided collectively on how the catch would actually be, uh, be achieved. In other words, who would go fishing, when they would go fishing, where they would deploy their gear. In terms of what they actually did, sort of how did they, how did they actually accomplish their fishing or what were the practices they carried out. Uh, one of the things they did that was quite striking is that they coordinated the location and timing of their members fishing. So uh, there was an incentive sometimes for, uh, for individuals in this fishery to start fishing further away from the, the ultimate destination of the fish just so they could contact the stock before anybody else did. But really the most efficient thing to do was to wait for the fish to swim to you. And at the time that in that process, they would become concentrated, and they were relatively easy to catch. Of course, if you didn't coordinate in that fashion, it would always be in somebody's incentive to get, a, to get out a little bit further and contact the stock ahead of the, ahead of the, the rest of the fleet. And one of the things that the, uh, the co-op tried to do was to coordinate that. They were going to fish here at a certain time during the period when we're allowed to fish. They coordinated information on... Uh, on where the fish were. So they reported information centrally on stock locations and migration patterns, and they would then send out boats to intercept concentrations of the stock. So there was a lot less search than would have been the case if, uh, if that kind of coordination had not been, had not been carried out. They uh, also installed shared infrastructure. This is something you don't normally think of happening in a, in a commercial fishery, but I'll describe what that was. Actually, I'll just do it right now. Uh, the migration route for sockeye salmon in this fishery is from out in the open sea through this. This is now a large blow up of the Chignik Lagoon, Chignik, uh, uh, the ultimate destination. They're basically heading toward this, this short river and then through a lake and on upstream. And what they did, uh, the co op members did, is they got permission to actually install some fixed nets in the form of a funnel that would kind of funnel these migrating fish down to a fairly small point in very dense concentrations in which case a first standard could make a single set and, and catch maybe five or ten times as many fish as they would have uh, through ordinary first standing. And again, this is something that the entire co-op did, and its members took turns using these fixed leads. And, uh, and the result was, uh, the bottom line result actually was, uh, uh, was substantial. So, you know, an e to an economist, this is very, very striking. The bottom line effect was a huge increase estimated profits in this fishery. We couldn't pin it down precisely, but uh, our estimates indicate that profits increased by somewhere between 50 and 110 percent for people who joined the co-op relative to what they, uh, they had been receiving uh, before the co-op was formed. So a big payoff. Uh, the co-op's demise, it was uh, shut down by the Alaska Supreme Court in 2005. Uh, this is the result of a a lawsuit by a group of uh, permit holders who chose not to join the co-op. And uh, they had a couple different objections uh, about the co-op. First of all, they thought the division of the catch between the co-op and this the, the fleet of non-joiners, who were basically, they also had an allowed catch, but uh, they thought it was not as high as it should have been. And so they objected to that. They also disliked the co-op's plan for dividing profits among its members. 
you know, some of them claimed, well, if they had had a different plan, we probably would have joined. Um, the Alaska Supreme Court, on its part, it ruled that uh, when the, the state assigned a portion of the catch, the allowed catch, to the co-op, that it actually exceeded its authority. But it turned out this would have been a fairly minor revision to the law to, uh, to fix that and remedy it and get the co-op going again, or at least give it the opportunity to, to reform. But uh, that law was never, never adopted. So to this day, it, the co-op is gone and it doesn't exist anymore, but it remains, I think, an instructive experience. Uh, I don't know how much time I have, but pretty much done? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, I was going to say a few things about uh, the power, but that was mentioned earlier. There, uh, that's an interesting case as well. Uh, so again, the bottom lines. I think the coordination can pay off, especially when the populations you're trying to manage are heterogeneous. But I think it's very important to uh, pay attention to who gains and who loses in that process to minimize conflict, because enough conflict can shut the whole thing down. Uh, and then finally, just on successes and failures, I did another another study or another paper that was. Uh, not exactly linked to this, but one of the things that I found in looking at co-ops, not just to manage fish, but to manage forests and water, uh, especially in poorer countries around the world, is that a, a key factor in the success of the ones that I looked at was to have some third party with uh, typically a government agency of some sort that, uh, that one could turn to if they were violators. So if there were poachers, having a third party that said, look, there's a law in the books, and I'll send the police after you if you come in and poach. That turned out to really be a necessary condition. And it was true both with communal forests, communal, uh, communally operated irrigation districts, communally operated fisheries. And the ones that had that kind of third party that you could turn to that had some enforcement power uh, did much better than the ones that didn't and tried to self-enforce. Thanks for your attention. So we do still have a few minutes for questions, but um, we're going to try really hard to hand you a microphone before you ask the question. Otherwise, we'll just have a recording of the answers, and it won't make much sense. Um, hello? Okay. So I'm one of the things in looking for indices of successes and failures, um, struck very much by the fact that Alaskan sockeye in general, um, Chignik, Crystal Bay, the status of those populations is fairly is considered fairly high, right. so that the tension between harvest and conservation agendas is not necessarily as high as it might be in Tillamook, Oregon, or Coos Bay, where co-ops are operating on salmon stocks that are more depressed. Did any of that play a role in success or failure when you were evaluating things? Well, I, you might guess that if there's some, if a, a stock and a whole fishery is really under stress that the, the operators, the people participating in that might be turning and looking for new ways of managing things to get themselves out of trouble. I don't have the perception that that happened here, that that was the impetus for it. I think the formation of the Pollock Cooperative kind of, and, and the experience with those that happened a few years ahead of that kind of gave some people this glimmer that maybe we could, uh, we could be doing better managing salmon than we are by using some sort of structure uh, of that form. Yeah. Were depressed or not depressed in this case, in the Alaskan example, yeah. not depressed. Right. You may not see. You may not have the features of the co-op truly revealed to you, in terms of when in other in another case where the conservation and harvest agendas were more in tension. So, in other words, if the if, if the uh, the situation is really dire and people were just scrambling uh, to get whatever they could from a, a livelihood they thought was going to disappear, that maybe the, the co-op would have a much tougher time operating. That's quite possible. I, I can't really say that I could, uh, I could point to evidence that, that would be conclusive one way or another on that, but it sounds plausible. Bob, do you know if there's a law on the state of in the state of California right now that allows the state to allocate a resource to a cooperative? I don't. I have to turn to maybe to our commission members, but I, I, don't, uh, I don't know whether there was or not. It turned out that in Alaska there wasn't, but the the regulatory agency, agency thought there was. They thought they had the authority. Uh, it turned out the Supreme Court disagreed with them. Somebody didn't then introduce uh, uh, a piece of legislation that would have changed, I think, one or two sentences in the Limited Entry Act that would have accomplished what needed to be accomplished. There was a very minor, minor detail in the legislation. But as far as California is concerned, I don't really know.
As they want to be on record. I think. As the uh, yeah, exactly. As the only lawyer on the commission, I have to say I don't know the answer to that question. I don't believe we have a limited entry statute in California like they did in Alaska. The commission does have a limited entry policy that was written about 10 years ago, and we're in the process of considering whether or not to revise that based on an evaluation of the MLMA, because the policy was written pre prior to the MLMA, or about the same time that the statute was passed. So. Uh, we need to look at the statutory basis in California for uh, putting together cooperatives like this. Uh, the lawyer that was working with the California Abalone Association and the AAG may have done this. What was that guy's name, Chuck? Uh, Joe Chris Sullivan, Sullivan may have looked at this. Okay. Hi. A question about the, the problem that you addressed with fluctuating um, cash that you get. What is the value of possibly under-exploiting a resource but are getting a steady revenue as opposed to going straight to the edge but accepting a certain amount of fluctuation? <laughs> and what Chris, I'm gonna call <laughs> the problem with type two error. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not quite sure how to answer that, to be honest. I, it's kind of more of a general management question than something, than something that's uh, I think it's specific to co-ops. I'm sure the cooperatives and the harvesters in general would much prefer a, a steady stream of revenue than, than something that fluctuates, uh, certainly as wildly as salmon can, can fluctuate. And presumably they could self-insure or maybe even insure in markets to achieve that. Um, it's not clear to me that a management strategy that tries to do that for them by adjusting the harvest to kind of minimize the risk they're bearing is, uh, I'm not convinced that's a good way to go, but I'd have to think about it. I'm not sure if that's really the question you were addressing, but uh, if not, we could uh, talk about it over, over a glass of wine.